Count Batten and his wife Edwina arrive in New Delhi. The great-grandson of Queen Victoria and second cousin to George VI, Mountbatten brings a regal presence to the drama of India's independence. As the last viceroy, he bears responsibility for India's fate. 2nd of April, 1947. I have now completed my first week in office. I should like to be able to paint an encouraging picture of my first impressions, but feel it would be misleading if I did so. The scene here is one of unrelieved gloom. At this early stage, I can see little common ground on which to build any agreed solution for the future of India. The only conclusion I have been able to come to is that unless I act quickly, I may well find the real beginnings of a civil war on my hands. By May, attempts to create a unified India have failed. Gandhi retreats from political life. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, leader of the Muslim League, and Jawaharlal Nehru of the Indian National Congress concede to divide India. Fearing a total loss of control, Mountbatten brings forward the transfer of power to August. Two nations will be created by partition, a secular India and a new homeland for India's Muslims, Pakistan. Nehru addresses the people of India. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. The 15th of August, 1947, the British Empire in India has come to an end. The last Viceroy, Louis Mountbatten. The flag raising and the salute were done amid scenes of the most fantastic rejoicing. And as the flag broke, a brilliant rainbow appeared in the sky, which was taken by the crowd as a good omen. Qasim Muhammad. On the 15th of August came freedom. The freedom to burn, loot and murder. While Delhi and Karachi were celebrating, Central Punjab was burning. Between August 1947 and March 1948, four and a half million Hindus and Sikhs are forced to migrate from Pakistan to India. Six million Muslims must move in the opposite direction. Britons and Indians witness the bloodshed. Shahid Ahmed. It is a battleground. People have gone mad. Trains to Pakistan are being looted and occupants slaughtered. We all knew that carnage was in the offing. So did Mountbatten. The British Empire, which tried to build India over centuries, can never live down this great tragedy. Lieutenant Colonel Hubert Boyd Hudson the sight from the air was awe-inspiring. In this chaos, millions of refugees were struggling to get to India or Pakistan. Thousands of others were doing their best to prevent them, murdering them by the hundred. But death is nothing. There are things more terrible than death. Ten million people are displaced in the partition of India. One million are dead. By the summer of 1948, most of the British have left. 
Hubert Boyd Hudson has been in India for 15 years. India is full of ghosts. Houses I have lived in, now inhabited by Indians, remind me of the days which will never come again. When the Viceroy drove past with a cavalry escort in red coats, I have seen the greatness of the British in India, but now it is all ended, and we are the last to leave, the few who are trying to tidy up the mess which this sudden splitting of an old empire has caused. Britain has lost its greatest imperial possession. Mahatma Gandhi once said, that if India became free, the rest of the empire would follow. In the next ten years, the fire of India's independence will spread around the globe, from the Middle East to Africa.